Before I welcome Johanna with us, I have to disclaim a couple of things to the Zoom audience in particular, but also to the people in the room here. Um, we are recording the language circle, good tradition, um, to put it on the web one day, hopefully. So in case you don't want to be recorded, uh, please uh, shut down your video. And for the people in the audience in the room here, if you don't want to be on the recording, then move outside the scope of the camera, if that's possible. I believe there's a corner somewhere where that works. Um, another thing that I need to announce, unfortunately, to the Zoom audience, you are all muted. And you cannot unmute yourself. And that's something we never wanted to happen, but we had to do it as a security measure because we had a Zoom troll in one of the language circle presentations earlier this year. And since we don't want any of that mischief to continue, we decided for the safety measure. So this means that for the discussion, um, if you have a question, and I'm sure you will have lots of questions for Johanna later, um, please uh, uh, raise a hand graphically and uh, also type a short version of your question into the chat so we can verify that this is actually a scientific contribution and that we will then be happy to unmute you. I know this is a bit of a pain, um, but uh, we decided to, to do this anyways. Okay, um, no speakers dinner today, right? Unfortunately, Johanna's heading back to Frankfurt because- Thank you has... for coming for the breakfast or... Yes, yeah, okay. Welcome, Johanna. Johanna Wimmerle of the Max Planck Institute of, uh, for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt am Main. Welcome back uh, in your kind of hometown, I like <laughs> um, Johanna uh, holds both a diploma and a PhD from Leipzig University. You received your PhD, of course, under the supervision of E. Schröger here, working uh, on, on the MMM as well, I believe, in the PhD, mm -hmm. very interesting earlier work. Afterwards, uh, you, uh, uh, you did um, a postdoc, in uh, New York University at the Department of Psychology. And I believe you're still somewhat affiliated with New York University as well. Yeah, to the claim. And while you through the claim, exactly. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that later. You stayed in Eppendorf for a while at the university clinic. And then since 2015, you have one of these rare and prestigious jobs uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics. So um, I'm very happy that Johanna is with us today. Johanna um, continues to deliver interesting uh, insight, in, interesting research on the role of oscillations um, with respect to speech processing, not only in the auditory system, but also uh, the interaction of auditory and motor systems. Now you're also reaching out to probably cover music. And uh, what I found really interesting when I just read your uh, CV on your webpage is that you're also turning towards assessing individual differences and in particular this inside out role um, that changes to uh, oscillations in the brain might um, play for our ability to, to, uh, to process speech and other auditory stimuli and for changes in these abilities. So I'm really happy to have you here and I'm sure we're all looking forward to your presentation. Johanna. Thank you Lars for the very nice introduction and thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to see your group and um, yeah hopefully engage a bit later. Um, yeah, and I'm also very happy to be uh, finally here in Leipzig again and see Erich and Dan. So please interrupt me when you have questions and if I'm not loud enough or something, please uh, let me know, I'm trying. So my talk is about individual differences in auditory motor interactions and how they shape speech processing. When we look at the speech signal, it's not obvious where linguistic unit starts or ends. It has been compared to reading text like this. And that's very difficult because typically we have spaces and punctuations. So it has been suggested that we need something like a speech segmentation mechanism. And it has been proposed that neural oscillations might provide such a, a yeah, function. I think you all know about this, so I will make it very short. But um, so yeah, what are neural oscillations? Um, to put it very simplistic, when new neuron populations fire in a synchronized manner, then um, we have high excitability phases. And it has been observed that there are fluctuations in excitability phases. So um, um, alternations in high and low excitability phases. And when we use electrophysiology, we can measure this as um, neural oscillations or brain rhythms. 
And it has been shown that um, this kind of neural oscillations um, um, can be observed in auditory cortex. And um, how can they um, help us to uh, for speech, speech segmentation? When we look at the speech signal, um, there are fluctuations in the energy, acoustic energy, at the syllabic scale. And it has been suggested that neural oscillations can align their excitability phase to the um, speech signal. That means that um, high excitability phases in, in, of the neuronal activity are aligned to high energy in the speech envelope. This has been termed neural entrainment um, and also speech tracking. So speech tracking is a bit more of a not yeah, yeah, term that has less theoretical assumptions than uh, neural entrainment. So I'm using the term speech tracking. And this kind of speech segmentation mechanism has been mostly investigated in auditory cortex. And I will show you several studies today where we wanted to know how such a speech segmentation mechanism might interact with um, other processes. Particularly, particularly, we are interested in how um, top-down predictions from the motor system can be integrated into such a mechanism. Um, I will also show you a study where we looked at linguistic predictability. And yeah, why are we interested in the motor system? So naturally, the speech production and perception system are tightly coupled. And it has been shown that even during passive listening, there is an activation of the motor system, which might indicate top-down um, temporal predictions from the motor system that facilitate um, speech processing. And a, a third point that is relevant is that the motor system is prone to training. So it is a good system, I think, to look at individual differences and see how individual differences in auditory motor coupling might affect speech processing. So one recent study um, that, that nicely showed these individual differences in auditory motor coupling is a study by uh, Florencia Asaneo and colleagues. They used a behavior protocol. They called it the spontaneous speech motor synchronization test. I, I don't know if people, if you have heard of this test. It's a nice short behavioral test where they present a random syllable sequence to participants and they have a syllable recognition task. So after the sequence, they get a syllable presented and have to say what was the syllable part of the sequence. But at the same time, they um, are supposed to produce speech. So they're supposed to um, rhythmic rhythmically whisper the syllable ta while they listen to the sequence. And then the authors measured um, whether individuals spontaneously synchronize their production to what they hear. And they did this by... Um, yeah, by computing the face locking value. So you can see here the data. Um, and the face locking value is an index of the synchronization strengths. And what they observed is that there is a bimodal distribution. So that there were some individuals that were not very good in spontaneously synchronizing. And they were called high, uh, low synchronizers or lows. And then there were others that did spontaneously synchronize their production. And they were called high synchronizers or highs. And importantly, they showed that this kind of behavior, synchronization behavior, is also related to brain connectivity. So they find that um, the high synchronizers, and um, what you see on the left, they show um, more structural connectivity in the left hemisphere between uh, areas that are related to speech, uh, that are connecting speech motor and temporal cortex, um, in, including also the accurate fasciculus. And they also showed that the high synchronizers um, have more functional connectivity. So this was measured in the MEG. And yeah, what they did is they, they showed that the high synchronizers show more um, tracking of the speech signal in frontal areas, uh, so speech motor areas. And this suggests that we can use this kind of um, SSS test, so this behavioral um, protocol, to estimate uh, the auditory motor synchronization strengths. And I will show you several a behavioral experiments where we use this protocol, and then also some neural data. So in the first experiment, um, this is also a study with Florencia Sanio and um, with David Purple and Jonathan Sandsper. And here, so Florencia has shown in her previous study that um, individuals um, yeah, synchronize their production to the perception. And here we wanted to know, does it go the other way around? 
So can we provide behavioral evidence for top-down effects from the motor system on the auditory system? And the second point that we wanted to know is, is this um, auditory motor interaction can be described by an oscillatory mechanism? And so first we again did this SFS test. And as you can see, we also find something like a um, bimodal distribution with high, um, low and high synchronizers. And then for both groups, we did a behavioral test with this paradigm. And we tested them in, so this were two experiments with different participants. And in both experiments, we had this basically the same paradigm where we have a prime sequence. So, and we'd also listen to a rhythmic syllable sequence. It was very simple, like t t t and everything was presented in white noise. Then they get a go signal, and then they have to produce the same sequence with the same rhythm and the same amount of syllables. And then they hear a folk syllable and have to do a syllable discrimination task. And um, the syllables presented at their threshold level in so for speech and noise. And yeah, we did this in two experiments. In the first experiment, we presented the prime sequence this year at two hertz. And then the second experiment, we, we thought that two hertz is maybe not very natural for the syllabic rate. So we uh, used in this case, for each individual, the, their spontaneous speech production rate as the prime. So we measured it first and then we used it as a prime. Okay, and then we were interested in, so first of all, we looked at what's the performance of the high interval synchronizers. And we find that um, overall, in both experiments, the high synchronizers um, are better in the syllable discrimination than the threshold level. So the syllables were presented as at a 65% um, threshold, and only the high synchronizers were better, the lows were not. And in the second experiment, the highs were also better uh, um, compared to the low synchronizers. So this suggests that the um, high synchronizers use this rhythmic motor production to enhance their performance because. Yeah, it, they were better when they had the rhythmic motor production compared to just the special method. But now we wanted to know, um, is this because they are better in certain phases of the motor rhythm? Because this would mean that there's something like a motor to auditory entrainment. So we were looking for a resonance effect. And so basically what we did is we analyzed the data um, um, with respect to the phase. So we, um, for each trial and each participant, we fitted a sinusoid and extracted the phase of the probe stimulus, the syllable. And then for each individual, we computed a log logistic regression where we um, um, predicted whether they were correct in the task based on the sinusoidal model of the phase. And then um, the sinusoidal model had a higher accuracy in the high synchronizers compared to the low synchronizers. Um, in both experiments. And additionally, we compared it to a null distribution and we find only significant effect in the high synchronizers. So this suggests that um, the high synchronizers seem to boost their performance in the task by being better in certain phases of the motor rhythm. Um, and this indicates that there's something like motor to auditory entrainment in the high synchronizers. So the next step we thought, um, are the data compatible with the neural oscillator model of the auditory motor interactions. And so in this model, um, we modeled auditory cortex and motor cortex interactions, um, assuming an endogenous rhythm of auditory cortex around 4.5 hertz. And the endogenous motor rate was set to the rate of the experiment, so either 2 hertz or the um, around the spontaneous production rate. And the important thing is that we um, assumed the bidirectional interaction of auditory motor cortex and that the interaction was scaled by the individual coupling strings. So from our experiment, we had the PLV values for each individual. And we um, now modeled the, um, in a dynamic system theory approach, the um, phase progression for auditory cortex and motor cortex by assuming this um, bidirectional interaction with different coupling strings. And yeah, what you also see is that um, so we modeled how the uh, produced speech signal looks by adding a jitter that um, has been related to uh, the time it takes from the muscle activity to the speech onset. And then we computed the uh, um, phase locking value between the uh, um, auditory cortex signal and the produced speech signal. 
And this basically um, is compatible with our data, as you can see. So we find the difference for the high and the low synchronizers. And this suggests that an oscillator model with bidirectional interactions that are scaled by the coupling strings um, can explain this kind of, or like replicate this kind of data. Um, yeah, so in summary, um, this experiment showed that um, the auditory motor coupling strings does affect the syllable discrimination and um, this suggests top-down effects from the motor system and it suggests that there might be an oscillatory mechanism involved in the interaction. So um, then we followed up on this in the next, so this is also a behavioral study. And here we wanted to know, um, do these individual differences in auditory motor interaction are they particularly relevant at um, fast demanding rates? So the motivation for this was that on the one hand, we know that in the speech processing, um, motor, the motor system is particularly relevant um, in demanding situations such as speech and noise um, perception. And on the other hand, this was motivated um, by the neural oscillator framework. Um, so it has been suggested in auditory cortex that um, there's something like a sweet spot for auditory processing in the theta range. So basically that um, the, the, the temporal processing and auditory cortex um, um, declines at rates higher than 10 Hertz. And this has been um, yeah, suggested for speech processing, but also for um, other auditory processes. So there's a long literature looking at amplitude modulated noise, um, rate discrimination or sequence rate discrimination. And we, when we look into this, we find um, or we found that there is quite some variance in when actually the performance declines for rate discrimination. Um, and then we thought maybe this is because of individual differences in auditory motor synchronization. So in this study, oh, this is a study that was um, led by Pius Kern and um, yeah, with again, the same collaborators and also Dominic Andres. Mm. So here we performed again this um, SSS test to look at the individual um, differences in um, yeah, the speech production perception synchronization. And we have these two groups of um, low synchronizers and high synchronizers. And then everyone performed another task. And in this case, we had um, yeah, pure tune sequences and um, participants performed the rate discrimination task. Um, they always listened to a standard sequence and then a comparison sequence, and they had to say which one was faster. So very simple task, and we did an adaptive procedure. Um, where we method the, the special, the different special for each participant. And so here you see the, the raw data and you see it separately, plotted separately for high synchronizers and low synchronizers in red and blue. And on the x-axis, you see the different um, rates of the standard rate. And what you can already see in this data is that um, at higher rates, um, there is a, an increase in the different threshold. And you can see also a little bit of a difference in the high and the low uh, synchronizers with the high synchronizers having a lower threshold. But what we were interested in is the behavior different across the rates. So is there particularly uh, a later um, increase in the threshold for the high synchronizers? And to analyze this, we uh, used Bayesian model comparison and we compared many different groups of models, which you can see here. So these are groups of models. So um, one model had uh, suggested there's only a baseline difference. So highs always have a lower threshold for the rate discrimination. And the other group of models suggested highs and lows have a different onset of this increase of the threshold. And then there was a group of models where we suggested both like a baseline difference plus a um, different increase. And then we had another one where we had a different um, slope for highs and lows synchronizers. And you can see here the posterior marginal um, probability. And you can see that it's um, highest for this group of models. And I only displayed here this group of models. So this is the winning model. And what you can see is on the x-axis, this is where the onset of the increase of the threshold is for the high synchronizers, so the, the rate. And on the y-axis, you see the onset of the increase for the low synchronizers. And the winning model is suggests that um, for the low synchronizers at 8.7 um, hertz, there is an increase of the threshold, but it's later for the um, 
high sun collisions is it's only at 11.8. So they're still good with um, rates around eight and hertz or 10 hertz. Um, yeah, and so you can see the probability is not super high, but then if you accumulate it for all the models that suggest that there is a later um, onset of the decline for the high synchronizers, then it's a higher probability. So that's the uh, model prediction, and this shows it a bit better that you can so you can see that the high synchronizers in orange um, show a later increase of the threshold according to this model, and um, yeah, compared to the lows. Um, yeah, which is interesting because this could suggest that maybe if you think about a neural oscillator approach, maybe there's more flexibility in the individuals with high auditory motor coupling. And yeah, and the next step we wanted to know, um, does it have any relevance for speech comprehension? Because this was rate discrimination and which is of course, yeah, much more simple or at least a different process. Yeah, so the next study, um, this is also a behavior study, but um, we did the same study also in MEG um, after that. So this is a study that was led by Christina Lubinos, and it's a collaboration with Anna Keitel, Jonas Opleser, and David Pepper. And so here we wanted to know, is there any effect of this auditory motor synchronization on continuous speech comprehension, which is of course difficult because we know that many complex processes are involved in continuous speech comprehension. When I say continuous speech comprehension, I mean listening to a continuous sentence. Um, yeah, so still artificial, but um, yeah. And the motivation for this was um, so if we assume that we have a neural um, oscillator model of um, speech segmentation, we would think that the speech segmentation process is affected by, on the one hand, the auditory motor coupling strengths. Um, but on the other hand, also by the other characteristics of the auditory motor system, so the endogenous rates. Um, so I just displayed this figure from the um, Keitlin Gross paper because they looked at endogenous rates in um, auditory cortex. So they uh, used the spectral profile um, pipeline, and um, I mean, other people did this too, but they did very nicely in um, disentangling different rhythms in these areas. So here, um, I think it's the left auditory, the left heterogyrus. And they show you have a delta rhythm, a theta rhythm, an alpha rhythm, and a theta rhythm. And why the alpha rhythm is um, suppressed during speech comprehension and the theta, theta is enhanced. So basically, the idea of the oscillatory framework is that we have something like an endogenous brain rhythm that is present in the brain, even though we have no stimulation. So we would still observe these fluctuations in excitability. And so we here did a behavioral estimate of these. Um, um, brain rhythms by looking at, um, so the brain rhythms have preferred rates, and we were looking at um, preferred auditory rates by behaviorally estimating it. And um, the same, we did the same for the motor rate by using the spontaneous production rate. Yeah, and it was also due to corona that we did a behavioral experiment here. Yeah, and we saw that if speech segmentation is affected, this should also affect uh, comprehension. So when in this study, it was an online study, um, but we also uh, had an in-lab experiment where we replicated part of it. And so it included only part of the task. So that's why I'm now um, showing you the online experiment where we had more tasks in there. Um, so we had a speech comprehension task. Um, their participants listened to sentences of different speech rates and they had to do a word order task. So they had to say, they, they got a, Two words display to targets and to say is this the correct order, yes or no. Then we estimated the preferred auditory rate by um, presenting participants a reference stimulus and a comparison stimulus. These were two sentences with the same content but with different rates. Participants had to say which they would like to or prefer to listen to. For the spontaneous speech and motor production tasks, we did free speaking. This one's get a prompt and had to do some like free speaking and we analy analyze the articulation rate. And so here you can see the data, um, first of all, of the behavioral, of the behavioral measures. So again, we did the spontaneous speech synchronization test, um, having two groups, one low and high synchronizers. And these in gray, you see for all the participants, the preferred auditory rate, here the um, spontaneous motor production rate. 
what you can see is that the preferred auditory rate um, is on average higher than the preferred model rate, which has been suggested previously. But when you also when you look at the distributions for the high synchronizers and for the low synchronizers separately, you can see that there was not much of a difference between those. Um, and then we just um, computed a generalized linear mixed effects model, and we were regressing the speech comprehension performance by all these parameters. And what we find is there is a main effect of the rate, which is not surprising, but we find that people um, show a reduced comprehension performance at higher rates. And we find a main effect of the auditory motor synchronization. So high synchronizers were better overall in speech comprehension. So we would have hoped that this was particularly the case at high rates, but it wasn't significant in the direction. Um, but this seems to be a general effect. Additionally, we found that the motor rate, the spontaneous kind of speech production rate, um, when it was higher, people had a higher uh, speech comprehension. Yeah, and we had also working memory um, parameter included, and this also was related uh, to the comprehension. So higher working memory score, higher comprehension. So this is um, partly in line with what we expected. What we did not find is an effect of the preferred auditory rate. Yeah, but otherwise, and we did not find this interaction, but we also had a different um, yeah, paradigm here than for the rate discrimination. We had not a very fine resolution at the low frequencies because speech comprehension is still very easy at the low frequencies. So it's hard to find differences there. Additionally, we looked at linguistic predictability here. Um, this is because, of course, in a yeah, when we listen to sentences, linguistic predictability becomes relevant. Um, and also recently it has been suggested that um, this might be um, affecting auditory cortex um, oscillatory mechanisms. And we were also interested in does it in any way interact with the um, yeah with the motor system effects? Even though we had no very um, clear hypothesis about this, this was more exploratory. Um, so we used the recurrent neural network to analyze the predictability of a sentence, and then used um, perplexity as index. And what we find is first of all the main effect. So if you have more predictability of a sentence, you have a better comprehension, uh, which makes sense. Then we find an interaction with uh, the rate. So the higher linguistic predictability helped most at demanding rates, at fast rates. We see here, and then we also found an interaction with uh, auditory motor synchronization, so that the high synchronizers seem to slightly more use the um, linguistic predictability. But I think this is something that we did not have hypothesize in the which needs replication. So in summary, um, we find that speech comprehension is um, affected by these auditory motor characteristics and that individuals with higher spontaneous production rates have higher comprehension and with stronger coupling or like synchronization have also stronger, higher comprehension. And we do find this interesting interaction with um, the predictability, linguistic predictability. Um, yeah. We did not find the effect for the preferred auditory rate. So then in the next study, we so we want to know, does it also work on the neural level? So what is the basis for this um, behavioral effect? And this is again a study uh, led by Christina Lubinos and with the same team. And yeah, we basically use the same paradigm here as in the study before. Um, this was recorded in MEG. And one difference is that for the comprehension task, we used the recall task. So individuals um, listened to a sentence and then had to report each word back. And we analyzed the um, yeah the percentage correct, and the reason for this was so the previous experiment that I showed you we had two tasks we had this word order task but also recall recall task this was in the in lab experiment, and as you could have seen in the data before the the, the word order task was very it was rather easy so people had a high performance even at high rates, and we wanted to have a yeah a wider um, range of um, variants explained. So basically, we took this harder task, um, yeah, which we didn't use in the online task be um, because, um, of course, this takes time, and then it's not so good for online experiments. 
So here um, are the comprehension data. So we again use sentences presented at different rates, um, up to 75 um, syllables per second. And you can see again that they um, show a decline in the comprehension. And we measured all these other measures behaviorally. So the um, again, the um, speech mode of synchronization and was a low, finding low and high synchronizers. And again, the spontaneous production rate and the preferred auditory rate. And this shows um, um, again that the motor rate is slightly lower on average than the auditory rate. So behaviorally, uh, we run the same analysis and replicated our previous findings. So, <laughs> so basically we find the same effects, but additionally this time we also find uh, uh, an effect of the preferred auditory rate, which we did not find in our previous study. And um, so the motor rate effect we now replicate in the third experiment. So because the first experiment I showed you included two tasks with the motor rate, um, but the auditory rate effect we only found in this one. But interestingly, we here also find interactions. So there was a two-way interaction of the auditory rate and the synchronization, and a three-way of all three variables. And I think this explains why we did not find the auditory rate effect in the previous experiment, because it is interacting with the um, auditory motor synchronization strengths. So if we have more, like a group that includes more highs versus more lows, there can be slight variance in whether something gets significant or not. And in the other experiment, the auditory rate effect was also, it was close, it was a trend or close to a trend at least. Um, so yeah, I think that's explaining the, the difference. So but overall we replicated the findings, which is nice. And yeah, then we were interested in the neural, at the neural level, what, what's happening there. And particularly we wanted to look at speech segmentation indicators. So at speech tracking and auditory cortex. And this is still some pre preliminary analysis. So we're doing still running some control analysis. And yeah. So what Christina computed is mutual information between uh, the speech envelope and the brain signal. And she uses multivariate um, mutual information. And she computed it for um, different frequencies between 3.5 and 20 hertz for all our different conditions. So our conditions are slow and fast sentences from like five hertz to 70.5. And um, what we find, um, what you can see on the left is that for each of the syllable rate conditions, we do see a peak in the speech tracking at the syllabic rate. And this is the normalized mutual information and, and so Z values. And you can see that everything over the um, gray Shaded area is significant. Um, yeah, so basically we find um, always at the syllabic rate uh, significant speech tracking. And she also looked at the periodicity part of this uh, signal by doing this foofing algorithm. And you can see that, yeah, that, that's basically um, the rhythmic part of the signal. So basically, we find speech tracking in heterogyros at all of these uh, for all of these conditions. Um, then we were interested in coupling, and she computed the mutual information also for the brain-to-brain -brain coupling, and we computed it for heterogyros at two um, yeah speech motor areas. One is SMA and one is IFG. And we computed it for both areas because um, yeah theor theoretically both um, are supposed to be relevant, and so um, yeah, uh, I suppose. And what you can see is that again, so here it's SMA, um, and you can see that we again find peaks for each syllabic rate condition at the um, syllabic rate. Additionally, we see some subharmonics there, yeah. And for the IFG, we also see peaks for the syllabic rate conditions, but they're not as pronounced. And um, we additionally see at five hertz for all conditions a peak. Um, and we see that overall the IFG con connectivity with heterogyrus is much um, lower than the one for the SMA. And this is not only in the, in the normalized data, but this is also in the raw data. So then the third variable that we're interested in is the um, endogenous brain rhythms. So we looked at um, 
So we wanted to know when we have resting state data, so we've recorded the resting state data, um, is the peak of the theta brain rhythm that we observe in heterogyrus and in um, the motor areas, is this in any way related to the speech tracking um, ability? And I think this is a relevant aspect of the neural oscillate oscillatory theories, which is often not tested because of course the rest of the data is always, yeah, it's noisy and it's not, yeah. Um, also not so easy to get good peak measures. So uh, what Christina did is she used this um, spectral profile pipeline by um, Anna Keitel and Joachim Groß. Um, and we got this group clusters for uh, the brain rhythms in these areas. And then she extracted for each individual the peaks of these um, clusters, which you can see here for Heterogyrus, Keta, and for IFG. In IFG, it was not that amazing, but yeah, <laughs> and for SMA. And here you see uh, the distribution of the peaks for these areas. So of the peak frequencies, I have to say. Um, and this is the group clusters. So for Heterogyrus, it looks very nice. And also like what Anna has shown, what we have shown before, for IFG, it doesn't look so impressive on the group level. And for SMA, it looks also very similar, like what Anna Keitel and what we have shown before. Like we find the theta and the better rhythm. Yeah, and then we um, computed um, regression models where we were interested in, um, can we predict the um, speech tracking sig signal in Heterogyrus by these parameters? And we did compute separate models for SMA and IFG. And what we find is that for SMA, the theta peak in Heterogyrus is predicting the speech tracking negatively though. And the coupling is predicting it positively. And there's also an interaction between the coupling and the Heterogyrus. For the IFG model, um, it's only significant that we find this two-way two interaction between Heterogyrus um, um, peak and the coupling. So it's it's more complex than we wanted it, but <laughs> so what's interesting is that the I mean the interaction looks very similar in IFG and in um, SMA. Um, so basically, what it's saying is when you so at the x-axis you have the Heschel gyrus peak of the where yeah, the um, like, what do you call it um, the theta peak. And so if that is a lower peak, you can see that there is more difference between um, whether someone has, someone has high or low coupling for the speech tracking. So if you have a low um, hash gyrus peak, then if you have high coupling, you have higher speech tracking. If you have a high hash gyrus peak, it flips, but it's not such a strong effect of the coupling. So what is interesting is that we do find the same two-way interaction also in the behavior. So it looks, uh, looks like that. But yeah, we're still like trying to find a good dynamic system theory interpretation for this. Um, yeah, so to summarize this, um, we observe effects of the, um, the coupling strengths and the auditory motor characteristics at the behavioral level, and partly we do observe them also at the neural level. Um, so this suggests that the speech segmentation mechanism might be affected by this, even though I, I assume this is not the only um, process that is affected which, yeah, I would also think it's indicated by the um, interaction that we saw on the behavioral level with linguistic predictability. We do not find the um, effect of the voterism on the neural level. But it might also be that our measure for some reason is too noisy, or I don't know. Um, yeah, and it also shows, of course, it's a complex relationship between all these parameters. Yeah, so in general, I think that, that we have some evidence that um, characteristic of the auditory and motor system affects speech processing that might take place at this level of speech segmentation if we say that speech tracking indicates uh, speech segmentation. And it's partly in line with the neural oscillator model. Um, yeah, I'm saying partly because um, it depends a bit on the characteristics of the model and um, yeah, we have to further understand the interactions. So I think, um, I don't know how much time I have, but um, is there some time? Okay, because I, I wasn't sure if I should present this study too. Um, so this study is um, led by Vivian Barchett, or Barchett, who is doing a PhD now here in Leipzig. And here we wanted to know um, 
are there differences in auditory motor synchronization with speech and music? And if we have time, I can quickly go through this. I can do that later. So um, this is a collaboration also with Molly Henry and Claire Pelofi. Um, so, and the motivation for the study was that it has been suggested that for speech processing, the coupling between auditory and motor cortex is rate restricted. So this goes a bit in the direction of the research that I just showed you, but it has also been shown by Florencia Sanio that um, there's stronger coupling at certain rates. So um, she found that at 4.5, there is the strongest coupling when we listen to syllable sequences. So in the data that I just showed you, we do not see that, but we have very different data. So um, yeah, we have to look further into this, but it has been suggested that it's weight restricted and um, and that there is for speech um, auditory motor coupling, that there is the best rate around 4.5 Hertz. And for the music domain, um, there is, yeah, most research on tapping that suggests that there is a sweet spot for processing um, around, yeah, two Hertz and a bit slower, so around the beat level. And so we thought maybe there are two different um, mechanisms for auditory motor synchronization. Um, and yeah, wanted to further investigate whether whether that's the case. And we used the behavioral um, paradigm. And we additionally um, were investigating whether this is related to the which motor effector is used. So if we use tapping or speaking. Um, so it could be related to the stimulus, like syllables with the tones or to the motor effectors. And in this study, we um, had several tasks. So on the one hand, auditory motor synchronization tasks. So this is very similar to the SSS test, but we added uh, conditions here. So we, we tested participants at uh, rates of 2 hertz, so the sweet spot for music, and 4.5, the sweet spot for speech. Um, and we tested them with piano tone um, sequences and with syllable sequences. And they had to synchronize either by tapping or by whispering. So using the speech uh, articulator. And this was like um, crossed in all ways. And additionally, we did a perception task. And this perception task, um, this must listen either to tones, piano tone sequences or the suitable sequences. So here we wanted to know when we have no overt production, do we find um, also a, a preferred rate for the music domain at around two hertz and for the speech domain around 4.5 hertz? So participants performed a uh, duration deviant. The last a tone or syllable was um, earlier in certain cases, and then they had to indicate after the sequence um, whether there was a deviation or not. And what we find is that, so first of all, for the synchronization task, you can see here um, oops, <laughs> our analysis. Um, what you can see is that um, there's a main effect of the rate. So everyone was better in synchronizing at slow rates. Um, but there was also an interaction with, um, with the motor effector. Um, so what you can see is that at slow rates, we find a difference between tapping and whispering. So tapping is advantage at slow rates. There's no difference at fast rates. So even though in general, whispering seems disadvantaged, so synchronizing our speech but um, this is not so much a case for fast rates. So this is kind of in line with our hypothesis that there is a sweet spot for music at two hertz and for speech at 4.5. Even though on top of this, we find this overall um, easier synchronization at two hertz. So then we per uh, performed the PCA analysis to see if we have something like independent components um, or the different motor effectors that indicate something like an independent timing mechanism. And we get these three components that explain the most variance and um, or have eigenvalues over one. And we find one component where all of the fast um, synchronization processes are related to. So we conclude, yes, we have one fast timing mechanism. And then we find a second component where particularly the slow whispering is a loading arm. So we, yeah, and the second and the third component is one where particularly the slow tapping is loading on. Um, so we concluded basically we have possibly different mechanism at the slow time scale for whispering and tapping. And then we looked at the perception task. And in the perception task, we find that individuals were um, better for 
the deviant detection at um, slow rates for the um, the tones. Um, or yeah, to say for, for tones, they were best at slow rates and for the synapses at faster rates. So this is in line with our hypothesis. And additionally, we um, we tested whether the perception performance is predicted by the um, synchronization performance. And this was the case for the fast component and for the slow um, tapping component, but not for the other one. And also only the fast component was related to musical training uh, or musical sophistication more specifically. Um, Yeah, so basically, we, we conclude from this that there might be um, um, different optimal time scales for the speech and the music domain. And um, possibly, particularly at the slow, slow rates, there are independent timing mechanisms. Okay. <laughs> then I want to thank everyone. So, um, first of all, all the students who did this um, work, like Sina Lubinos, um, Vivian Rashad, and Pius Kern. And then my collaborators, um, Valencia, David, um, Anna Keitel, Jonas Opleza, um, yeah, and all my other collaborators. And of course, you for listening. Thank you, Johanna, for the rich presentation. Really yeah. enjoyed it. Uh, maybe we get started with uh, questions from the chat. So uh, from, from the online audience, I mean, so if you have questions, then please raise a, a graphical hand and type your question into the, uh, to the chat. Doesn't seem to be the case. Questions from the audience. Uh, Lorenzo. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so many, so much data. <laughs> um, I have a question on the in temporal dynamics of the synchronization. So we know from the infringement literature that it takes some time to actually align the uh, phase to mm -hmm. like where it takes to align. So I wonder if you could uh, see any differences between auditory to motor, motor to auditory synchronization. Hopefully, good time. It's time. I mean, in this SSS test, there's always um, two trials that are computed. Uh, they're quite long. Um, I know, are they 30 seconds or something? I forgot. But, um, but um, so we always compare the two trials. And if they're not correlated, the participant doesn't get included. But we don't look into it like time-wise, like yeah. time otherwise. Um, yeah, we have not done in the other data. Um, but yeah, I would also assume that it takes some time. It's true. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, I'm left with the question that whether about um, this synchronization and this coupling, like what is the um, direction? Of mm -hmm. the so you mean that maybe the low synchronizers take more time or something? Yeah. Yeah. So whether they rely more on the auditory system or the motor, like mm -hmm. what is. I mean, I think what Florencia and Asani had some follow up research, I think it is published already, where she um, looked into why. I mean, so what she found before is that it's rather stable whether someone is a high or low synchronizer. But then she um, showed in this study that one can train it by um, if you present something like a very regular um, yeah, envelope rise, so something like only the same pure tone or always the same syllable and you train participants, then they increase the synchronization. So this suggests that it's um, related a lot to like, yeah, specific timing of the, like processing the edges of the envelope. And yeah, when it's more complicated, it's, it's not always an eyes, like very exact same timing of the, of the syllable. So that, that this is a process where, where high synchronizers are better. Um, yeah, I don't know if additionally, um, I mean, they, they were all trained before um, in whispering without synchronization. So before this test, they do something like a task where they just whisper so that they um, train a bit the rhythmic production. And we typically typically don't find um, yeah difference in the periodicity of this kind of um, production. Um, so this might, might make it also easier to quickly synchronize them, but I don't really know, yeah. Um, what Florencia has shown in our original study in the Nature Neuroscience paper from 2019, 
think she looked at how well they adapt to changes. And they show, she showed that only the high synchronizers adapt well to the changes in the sequence, um, which maybe is a bit in line with what you're saying, that there is a quick, um, yeah, um, ability to quickly synchronize well. I cannot say more about it. Yeah, yeah, but when you talk about the bidirectional uh, interactions, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, like which directions helps this uh, basic analysis? Yeah, yeah, yes. You mean if this is pushed by the motor system or? I mean, I would assume that once, like the high synchronizers use the motor system more for the for this process, like more, yeah, motor predictions or back. Um, we actually look more into this still at the moment with an MEG study, but I have no results. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So if nobody else has a question, so if I'm allowed, I have many of question. Um, I think it's related with the previous question, but but uh, takes a broad, broader view. So so first, I think this. Is the data are uh, incredibly fascinating. So it's really, really much research in my view. And, and I, because you talked about individual differences and, and uh, in other fields, people also looked at individual differences. For example, in intelligence research and sorry, how well individuals score in working memory uh, um, uh, performance. And, and what they found to my memory record, I just wanted to look at, at Google, but I couldn't find it so quickly. But if I remember correctly, it says that intelligence correlates to a considerable degree with the basic information processing speed mm -hmm. that an individual has. Mm -hmm. And the same seems to be true if my memory record is true for working memory score. Mm -hmm. So Chinese people, they talk much faster and, and, and understand speech much faster than, 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 uh, than most of us, except you, because you speak mm -hmm. Chinese and they have also better memory, uh, 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 work memory scores. Mm -hmm. And, and probably this correlates as well with intelligence. Mm -hmm. And although you presented that the, the overall picture is quite complex and there are very, very many different uh, effects to consider and interactions, but one, maybe one constant or maybe one underlying cause of your effects could be related to information processing speed. Yeah. So it makes you uh, able to faster tap and to, to understand better, even if, if the input, the language or the yeah. input is faster. Um, and maybe this, this benefit in being able to process information quickly also helps for better synchronization mm -hmm. uh, between different domains in the brain. In this media, it's a better timing. Yeah. And maybe this could be a, a worth considering that, that there is a, maybe a, a simpler factor which can partly explain part of the effects. Uh, yeah. In these domains, you said. Yeah, I, I agree. That's super, this is super interesting. So we look at the um, whether high loss and show different working memory scores, because yeah. we also thought that it would be interesting if that's related. And it was not very stable. So we did not find a stable, strong, uh, higher working memory score in high synthesizers. We, depending on what we like, um, yeah, the sample size, something we find, something like a trend, but yeah, it wasn't very stable. So, um, I think that one has to look more into this because also in the like also in the original study from Fonsi Alsanio, they looked um, at the word learning paradigm and they find that the, the high synchronizers were better with this. Um, and then on top of this, we find this interaction with linguistic predictability, which I think is very interesting, which suggests there should be something, yeah. So if it's not working memory, if it's more like um, information processing speed or something, yeah. do you have a good idea of like how to progress to this or like? I think this is an established expression, so which is used in other fields. But of course, it's it's not very well defined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I mean, for this neural data, we can also have a closer look at if there are other interactions that we find um, at other levels and not auditory cortex speech tracking. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a good point to further understand. I think the the measure that sorry, Burkhard, you are next in line. I just want to read the the measure that you're using um, in the study with uh, with Jonas, the pred predictability measure that essentially what what Shannon says we should measure information with, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the, the the contextual probability of something coming in. It's like the mm -hmm. Information theoretic currency mm -hmm. quantifies information. We don't have a better one, I think. So you mean that the high yeah. synchronizers can use this better is already some, but one has to test this more directly, I think. Yeah. I don't know. In a way, when you have your measure the way that you have it, it's the inverse of information because you have the predictive, mm -hmm. you know, and information is essentially what's unpredicted, what's left, what you don't know yet. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what we wanted to do with Odenta. Mm -hmm. So like, and that's that's I think the interesting thing, what that relationship is between the time window that you have and the amount of information that you can eat, and that might not mm -hmm. be the same. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, Burkhardt. Burkhardt is next. Uh Carl, can you unmute? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm gonna use it. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. And uh I was I would like to ask if I understand it correctly, then there was the uh preference at higher speeds for let's say the uh, syllables and and uh, over let's say simple tones or so which i found quite surpri surprising that i would expect that that you could always perform better on, on the sim sim simple tones and i was uh, i would like to ask if if i understand it understood it correctly and what kind of model you have uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, you're completely right. I, I did not say one thing. So, mm -hmm. so this was only the case for the perception task. But what we actually did in the perception, so in the synchronization task, we find a main effect of the rate. So everyone was always better at two hertz and slow rates. And for the synchronization task, we uh, for the perception task, we piloted the study before to have the same difficulty of the um, temporal deviant detection for uh, syllables and tones. So if we wouldn't have done that, everyone would have been better for the tones. Uh -huh. okay. So there would have been a main effect. So but we wanted to get rid of the main effect to look at uh, the interaction. And if so we had the same, so to have also a range of, of performance. Otherwise, one group would always be at ceiling, so either floor or like ceiling. Um, so basically, um, we piloted the study so that everyone was around the same performance for syllable deviant detection and or in, on average, I mean, and um, tone deviance detection, and then we looked at whether which time scale is um, yeah processed better. So, but there would be a main effect otherwise that everyone is better with foot with tones. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. So um, this is according to the expectations. Yeah, yeah. And then so, would you expect so that to go even faster than than that it deteriorates? Because I mean, I could imagine that there is some kind of let's say only narrow preferred range for the syllables and and if you tackle this preferred range then of course you you might see the preference for this speed but if you go higher or lower than then syllables are less well um, perceived and also repeated in the rhythm um yeah so you would assume if you include more rates then we find this this range not more nicely or mm, yeah if you're, um, if you're too fast i mean I, I i can't imagine that this goes that's a really to arbitrary speeds. So yeah, no, I agree. I mean, this is when we had the con more continuous speech that we were included the very fast rates, and to see when it declines. Yeah, yeah, and of course, yeah, we find find then that it declines at some point. Um, but we haven't done this for the um, this spontaneous speech synchronization test. Um, I think there was a recent study that actually did that. It's published in Neurobiology of Language. Um, I think it's he he at all, and they um they looked at this. The SSS test at different rates, and they find also that there's a sweet spot around 4.5. Um, and compared it to this data that Florencia Asanio had um, published on the neural coupling of auditory motor system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they did something like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank I you. Second question. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, there was on uh, slide 23 where you somehow presented these individually uh, estimated uh, peaks. And and then there were these uh, magenta lines, which some yeah, which may have represented a kind of average or so, but it it seemed to be at the lowest. You can 
to type in 23 enter. Yeah. And, 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 and then uh, eyes to, to see that the magenta lines were so, so low, it was not in the average at all. So I was, yeah, I would like to ask how you estimated the magenta lines. I mean, here? Yeah, and at the left side, left upper, yeah, 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 these IT. curves. <laughs> yeah. You mean this for the IT particularly, or? Yeah, these magenta lines, they, they are not in the middle of the gray lines, but they're rather at the lower edge or even lower. Yeah, yeah. So it is it is a bit complicated to get an algorithm. So what we did is, what you see on the bottom is the group level clusters, which we get from these um, uh, spectral profile method. And what we have then for each of the clusters on the group level, they load on the individual level. And, um, but on the individual level, they load on several clusters. So an individual might have five clusters loading on a cluster on the group level. And we pick the one with the most um, biggest amplitude on the individual level. That means the data in the group level is not fully explained by the individual peaks. Mm -hmm. Because, we, so this was to like avoid a bit of noise. I don't know if this is the best choice, but basically, um, yeah, we picked the individual cluster that loaded, uh, had the highest amplitude and loaded on the group level theta cluster. That's, I think the magenta line is a group level cluster and the gray lines is the individual cluster with the highest amplitude. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's bit, I mean, it's a bit tricky to see what of, which is the best parameter for, um, so to have a theoretical, um, yeah, approach to say which is the best parameter. Um, yeah. yeah, but that's what we choose. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's a bit surprising. I mean, to see it here, and I mean, um, of course, mm -hmm. I assumed that the magenta line is some kind of group level, but then I was thinking, okay, then the averaging somehow, yeah, was not really great. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not the average of this. No, it's it's yeah, a yeah. it's a group it's... cluster where those. Yeah, but you're right. Maybe we should display differently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I have two questions for me. <laughs> So the first one is kind of easy, but I was struck by the dissociation between the IFG and the SMA in the coupling study. Yeah. And you showed earlier the Asaneo uh, result that there was even um, differences in the um, frontotemporal white matter. Mm -hmm. So now I'm, of course, wondering um, whether uh, in the original Asaneo study, she was able to localize the white matter change to either the accurate or the uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus because some people believe that one targets the SMA BA6, whereas the other one reaches further into the mm -hmm. kind of posterior regions of the, of the IFG. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be nice, I think, because the functional dissociation seems to be so strong in terms of the coupling. Yeah. Um, and so you would also expect that this should be this one here should be genuine to the to the track that terminates and BA6 and the SMA. No? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting to hear that. So I could I could look that up, but I think what they so what they emphasize in the paper, I think that um that it particularly included the arcuate fasciculus. Mm -hmm. I did not, I not remember if it also so it was basically overlapping with these um with these areas. Um so what they did in their MEG study, they used, used more of an IFG cluster. I mean, you can see it's a very broad cluster, but um, it includes rather the IFG than the SMA. And um, yeah. so for Here our- it's both. Hmm? Here it's both. Because, you know, the, 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 the arcuate terminates in SMA mm -hmm. and the SLF reaches out further. Some people even say it reaches until BA45 or mm -hmm. those those controversial, but this cluster here contains both 44 and, and 6, mm -hmm. so IFG and SMA, mm -hmm. um, and so this is probably then, mm -hmm. then both, yeah. I mean, we, we can double check this one, one point, is, but it's a bit curious is that in our data, we have IFG and SMA, mm -hmm. and we checked like whether high and low summarizers Basically, whether we can kind of replicate this, whether we find a difference, a group difference between high and low summarizers, and we do find this actually for IFG. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even though we have the more stronger coupling for SMA, we find the group difference between this for IFG. But so I think they both be, they are connected and they are, so that makes it a bit more tricky, right? Um, yeah. It gets complicated. I mean, yeah. you have reports on complex short range connectivity patterns between IFG and SMA and blah, blah, blah. So there's local yeah. connectivity, there's 
long range connectivity is complex. Yeah, it would be interesting if we have some ways to like better disentangle like with MEG, yeah. probably not. I mean, it's just yeah. three or four centimeters. So, yeah, yeah that's what I also think. Yeah, but that's also why we looked at both of them. Um, yeah, but it's, because I think both are related, but um, yeah, it's not very clear in which like direct way. I think, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then my second question that's harder to answer. <laughs> um, because you know, I'm you know, I always think about culture and the brain and how they kind of come together and how one is the function of the other. And so you're showing these plots all over where you have low and high synchronizers. And then you have the story, of course, the high synchronizers, <clears throat> they're faster and then they're you know better memory and more intelligent, and that's great, it's awesome. But that's half the population. They're not more intelligent. <laughs> no, I mean, it's what people doing and what is it good for? I mean, they they it's 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 it's, it's uh, conserved, right? So there are people who are low synchronized. Yeah. What do they do? Can they do something better than the others? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we also and we are interested to understand that they might use a different strategy. Um, um, yeah, and of course it's only a small effect. I mean, it's a small effect that helps, like an advantage in timing that helps with certain things. Um, but it's not a, it's not that low synchronizers can't do. The if you, if you, if you look to the left side of the graph, I mean, you 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 crank up the speed, right? And then, of course, at some point you lose, lose track. And it's too fast. But how about and you're mentioning music, and then you have two. How about how about slow people? Okay. Like Eric Clapton, you know, you would never. I mean, it, so the, the high but the high synchronizing is also it's correlated with musical sophistication and musical training. Yeah. Um. Even though, of course, it's not complete, it's not complete the same, but it's um, correlated. Um, so I would assume that someone who's a musician who prefers slow is still good in synchronizing. Okay. <laughs> That's what I preferably would think. But um, and slow speaker. But, um, someone who speaks very slowly. And I think speaking fast is also not saying that you're uh, automatically a high synchronizer. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's probably how I understood it. Yeah, I would have thought that so, but we so we did not find this correlation. But um, um, at least it's not very clear. Um, it yeah, might be. In this data we did not clearly find it, but it's also an online study, and yeah, also in the second study we did not find this clear correlation. But yeah, I would have assumed this too, but it's not. Do you? Is it fifty-fifty, or is it more like? When, when you show the two um, mm -hmm. portions that you fit to the distribution, like of the high and low synchronizers, mm -hmm. so I think it depends if you have a very you need a very large sample to reject the unimodality. So for instance, I showed it maybe she had around three hundred. I don't know not how many, but large sample to reject it. And we find also if we have a larger sample, sample we find something like a trend for this. So this would be the claim that in a larger population you have bimodality, but um, yeah, I think it depends a lot on what your population is like. So we find in online study, we have more low synchronizers. In the in-lab study, we have mostly more high synchronizers because there are many people who are more affine to music coming to our studies. Mm. And, and yeah. So it is depends on your population. Okay. On, the, on the test, on the, on, the, on the sample, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering, yeah, okay, so, sorry, I'm overdoing it with the time, but it's just so interesting. I was I was wondering whether you might speculate about the underlying neurophysiology. I mean, okay, it's you're assuming it's an oscillation and it increases its frequency, and somehow in this part of the population it can do so more readily or something like that. But what what does it mean about the underlying electrophysiology so when you think of this in terms of inhibition excitation like yeah i think um the closest i could think about is so um, i mean i think we, we we still plan to model this better but there is already something that goes in this direction out from at large like a dynamic system theory model um, I, i'm sure you've seen that by um so the first author is iran Roman. And they modeled data, I think, from Karim Palmer and others, where people were um, tapping to uh, music or two people were synchronizing. And what they suggest is that um, one can explain um, effects of how well someone can synchronize to certain rates. Um, 
on the one hand by um, the endogenous rate, so whatever the spontaneous production rate is, but on the other hand, also something like elasticity parameter. So we have something, um, um, the elasticity parameter is included, oh, I said it wrong. So um, yeah, you have the, the endogenous rates, but then for the neural oscillator model, you have um, an elasticity parameter and you have heavy and burning. So meaning you have uh, the elasticity parameter is something like a pull to your endogenous rate. And then the heavy and learning explain how, how much you can expand your range to go away from the endogenous rate. Um, so this is not inhibition like you're saying, but it's a, it's a bit like showing yeah, what allows you to synchronize even to faster rates uh, and what brings you always back to your endogenous rate. So I feel this in terms of dynamic system theory, this is a very nice approach. Um, I'm not sure this answers your questions, but about... Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know either what 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 that would correspond to. Yes, you're more flexible. So you can leave your kind of preference or like your comfort zone or whatever. But it, physiologically, what how would that be possible? And what be, would be the difference? And and you are. But it's probably. Yeah, I mean, I would assume that. So I would have thought that, that maybe something like the heavy learning is basically like the connectivity with another system that helps you to expand your range, like say with the motor system. Mm -hmm. And then the, the elasticity is maybe a parameter of your neuron population, let's say an auditory cortex that pulls you back. Yeah. This is not exactly what is done in this model, but um, that's what I would have thought, but I don't know if this is <laughs> in any way true, but uh, but um, of course one could think more about inhibition, like more like a, a cognitive process then. Um, yeah, I haven't um, I haven't thought this way. Interesting. There are no further questions, either from Zoom well, or from... Wait, I have to maybe say that, but in the connectivity of the motor system might also be related to inhibition from the motor system, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but... And this can also be implemented in this kind of model, but, um, yeah. Maybe you can talk, yeah, about, you can talk later. Yeah, mean, yeah. 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 <laughs> Depending on the... Like, well, as I said, also the direction of the coupling and how it really operates. And that's the hard bit about functional connectivity these days that you can't really, or it's, it's, at least it's very hard to interpret the parameters that you get out of the functional connectivity analysis yeah. in terms of inhibition, excitation, the underlying electrophysiology, leaders and followers. It's not straightforward, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>